Hi everybody, and welcome to our second day of talking about multiple regression. Our goal for today is going to be to start talking about how we can use multiple regression to test for moderation by testing for interactions between predictors. Specifically, in this video, we'll talk about how to test for an interaction between one categorical predictor and one continuous predictor when we're trying to predict a continuous outcome variable. First, a quick review of what we've talked about so far this semester. Remember that our null model has no predictors, or like a cheese pizza, it has no toppings. So if we were to make a prediction based on no predictors or no information, our best guess would be that everyone's score is exactly average. For the first few weeks of the semester, we talked about simple regression, where we add one predictor, or we add one topping to our pizza, to see if adding that predictor made our predictions better. In other words, is the model with one predictor better than the model with no predictors? If it is, we would say that this predictor enhanced our ability to predict the outcome. Last week we talked about multiple regression, specifically two types of multiple regression. First we talked about simultaneous multiple regression, where we have multiple predictors all being used to predict the same outcome variable. What makes it a simultaneous multiple regression is we're throwing all of the predictors into the model at once, which is kind of like throwing a whole bunch of toppings onto our pizza at the same time. The first question we ask is, did these predictors collectively make our predictions better? Which is to say, is the model with all of the predictors better than the model with none of the predictors? If we find that it is, we then take a closer look at each individual predictor in the coefficients table in SPSS to see which predictors did make our predictions better and which ones did not. As a reminder, we should also check to make sure that our predictors are not too strongly correlated with each other. In other words, the assumption of collinearity. Toward the end of last week's class, we talked about a second form of multiple regression called hierarchical regression which is similar in that we're using more predictors, but we add those predictors in steps or blocks instead of throwing them all into our model at once. So maybe we first add pepperoni to our pizza to see if adding pepperoni made it better than plain cheese, and then we add sausage to it as well to see if having sausage and pepperoni is better than just having pepperoni. What this allows us to do is identify which predictors made our predictions better and at what point and by how much by looking at the R squared change statistics and the F change statistics in our output. At the end of last class, we started talking about the possibility that different predictors might interact with each other. For example, in one of the examples we did last week, we found that there was no overall relationship between alcohol use and life expectancy. However, maybe it's the case that alcohol use predicts life expectancy for some people, but not for other people. Maybe, for example, alcohol use does predict life expectancy for people who do not regularly wear a seatbelt, but it does not predict life expectancy for people who do regularly wear a seatbelt. In other words, it may be the case that there is a relationship between alcohol use and life expectancy for one group of people, but not for another group of people. That relationship would, in that case, depend on which group you're in, which puts us in the realm of talking about interactions. Today, we're going to talk about how to do problems exactly like this one, testing to see whether the relationship between two continuous variables depends on which group you're in. Before we can do that, though, we need to know how to do two things. First, we need to know how to include a categorical variable as a predictor in our regression. In all of the examples that we've done so far this semester, we've only worked with continuous predictors. Eventually, we're also going to need to know how to include an interaction term in our regression equation. For the rest of the semester, we're going to be talking about moderation and mediation, starting today with moderation and spending the next few weeks on moderation before turning to mediation later this semester. As a reminder, Moderation describes situations where we have a third variable, a moderator, shown as M on the screen, that dictates the strength, direction, or the existence of the relationship between X and Y. 
So for example, if x and y are related only for some people but not for others, we would say that variable m moderates the relationship between x and y. Another way to say that would be that there is an interaction between x and m in terms of how they predict variable y. In a few weeks, we will talk about mediation. A mediating variable is a third variable that explains the relationship between x and y. I won't get too far into that for now, but the, to, the thing to keep in mind is that moderation, a moderating variable, tells us when, or in other words, the conditions under which x and y are related, whereas a mediating variable tells us why, or the mechanism through which x and y are related. Before we can include an interaction term in a regression, there's two other things we quickly need to cover. The first one, as I mentioned a minute ago, is how to include a, a categorical variable as a predictor in a regression. Here again is our regression equation. Now, regardless of whether the x variable is categorical or continuous, the regression equation is going to look exactly the same. We're still going to have an alpha value, we're still going to have a beta value, and we're still using the value of x to predict the value of y. However, if the x variable is categorical, what we need to use is a process called dummy coding. For the first two examples we look at today, we're going to include an x variable in our regression that is dichotomous, meaning it has exactly two levels. Dummy coding simply means that we have to make sure that this variable is coded as either 0 or 1. So on this categorical predictor variable x, each participant will either have a 0 if they're in one group or a 1 if they're in the other group. In our write-up, we should always specify which of the groups was coded as 0. Usually that's going to be our control group. That's all there is to it. So each person in our sample will have an x score of either 0 or 1. So alpha remains the predicted value of y when x equals 0. Now in this case, x equals 0 would mean that you're in the control group. Therefore, alpha is going to be the predicted value of y for any person who is in the control group. We're accustomed to thinking of beta as the slope of our regression line, or in other words, how much we expect y to change every time x increases by 1. In this case though, x can only have two possible values, either 0 or 1. So an increase of one point would be the equivalent of moving from the control group to the other group. Therefore, when we're using a dichotomous x in our regression, beta is going to be the predicted difference between the two groups that we're comparing against each other. Here's an old example that we talked about last semester. You might remember this study as the one in which men were shown the same photo of the same woman on either a white or red background, and what the researchers found was that men preferred the woman's picture on the red background as opposed to the white background. They rated her picture as more attractive when it was on the red background. When we initially talked about this study, we used an independent samples t-test to compare these two groups of men, the white group and the red group, in terms of their perceived attractiveness of the woman in the picture. And what we found was a significant difference with a p-value of 0.013 and a t-statistic of 2.67, such that men who saw the woman on the red background rated the woman as more attractive compared to the woman on the white background. So what we have here is an independent variable with two levels, white or red, and a continuous dependent variable, their attractiveness rating of the woman. Could we test this same hypothesis using a regression now that we know how to dummy code a predictor variable that is dichotomous, such as white versus red? If you open up that same data file, redphoto.cv, you'll notice that the color variable is actually already dummy coded for us. Any man who saw the white photo has a score of zero for that variable, and any man who saw the red photo has a score of one for that variable. We could actually, instead of running a t-test here, run a regression in the same way that we normally would, going to Analyze Regression Linear. We would put the color variable, which is dummy coded as either 0 or 1, in the independence box, 
and we would put their attractiveness rating, which is continuous, in the dependence box. If we were to do that, this is what the output for our regression would look like. Notice that the t-statistic is exactly the same, and the p-value is exactly the same. So regardless of whether we use an independent t-test or a regression with a dummy-coded predictor variable, we get the same results. I also mentioned on the last slide that our prediction, uh, I'm sorry, our interpretation of beta changes slightly when we're using a dichotomous predictor variable. Specifically, beta tells us about how different we expect the two groups to be from each other. In this case, beta equals 1.13, which tells us that on average, we would expect men in the red group to have attractiveness ratings that are 1.13 points higher compared to men in the white group. And again, notice how those numbers are exactly the same regardless of whether we're using the t-test or the regression. Finally, I'll point out that alpha in this example is equal to 5.93. What that tells us is we would expect the average man in the white group to rate the woman's attractiveness as a 5.93 on that scale. The second thing we need to cover before we're ready to produce a interaction term in our regression is something called mean centering. As we'll see in a second, mean centering can help us make alpha more informative. In order to mean center a continuous predictor variable, what we do is we take each person's x score and we subtract the mean from it. So on the left, we have a depiction of a regression before being mean centered. Notice where the regression line crosses the y-axis and notice the slope of the regression line. By mean centering our x variable, what we're essentially doing is taking our whole graph and shifting it in one direction or the other. So the slope of the regression line doesn't change, but the y-intercept does change. In other words, alpha does change. The advantage of mean centering a variable is this. If we do not mean center a variable, alpha tells us the predicted value of y when x equals zero, as we've talked about previously. After we mean center a variable, however, zero becomes the score for a person who is exactly average. Therefore, alpha would tell us the predicted y score for a person whose x score is exactly average. After mean centering a variable, anyone who has a positive x score has a score that is above average, and anyone who has a negative x score has a score that is below average. Let's again see this in action using an example that we saw earlier this semester. A couple weeks ago, we ran a regression to see if the age of a professor predicts their reaction time on a reaction time task. And what we found that it is that as professors got older, their reaction time went up, meaning they got slower, with a p-value of 0 0.003. To be specific, if we look at the value of unstandardized beta here, we see that for every year that a professor gets older, we would expect their reaction time to go up by about three and a half milliseconds. So every year I get older, I will get three and a half milliseconds slower. Above that, we have alpha. Now, when we first covered this example, we talked about how alpha doesn't really make sense here. Because if alpha is the predicted value of y when x equals zero, the alpha value in this case, 431 milliseconds, tells us the predicted reaction time for a professor who is zero years old which of course makes no sense. Now, instead of just giving up and saying, well, I guess alpha will be useless in this case, what if we mean-centered our predictor variable, age, and see how that changes our ability to interpret alpha? We know how to calculate descriptive statistics in SPSS, and if we calculate in this data file the average age of professors in this sample, we'll find that the average age was 47.46 years. In order to mean center that predictor, what we'll do is we'll take each person's age score, the variable called age, and we'll subtract the mean from it. 
That will give us a new variable, which I've chosen to call age underscore cent, to tell us that it's the mean centered version of the age score. So compute a new variable called mean centered age or age cent. Make that variable equal to each person's age minus the average professor's age in our sample. After we do that, we will see a new variable in data view all the way at the right hand side of our data file which for each professor tells us how many years above or below the average age they are. Theoretically, if we had a professor who was exactly 47.46 years old, their mean centered age score would be zero. So as you can see down here, this first professor who's 36 years old, their mean centered age score is negative 11. In other words, their age is 11 years below the average of the sample. Professor number three, who's 55 years old, is seven years older than the average, so their mean centered age score is seven and a half. Now that we've done the mean centering, let's run this same regression again, but instead of using age, we'll use the mean centered age variable. So go to Analyze Regression Linear, keep reaction time in the dependent box, but instead of putting age in the independent box, now put mean centered age in the independent box instead and run the regression again. Here's what the output for that regression looks like. Notice that the t-statistic is the same as it was before, as is the p-value, as is the beta value, but the alpha value is different. The reason it's different is because we've mean centered our predictor. Because our predictor is now mean centered, alpha now tells us not the predicted reaction time for a professor who's zero years old, but the, the predicted reaction time for a professor who's average age, whose mean centered score is zero, meaning they're exactly 47.46 years old. So we can now say that for a professor of average age, we would expect their reaction time to be about 593 milliseconds, which makes a lot more sense than talking about an infant professor. We are now ready to start looking at interactions, but anytime we wanna test an interaction, we're gonna to need to do these things first. First, we're gonna to need to dummy code our continue, I'm sorry, dummy code our categorical predictor variable. Then we will need to mean center our continuous predictor variable. Only after we've done those things are we ready to test for an interaction. Here's what our regression equation is going to look like when we wanna test for an interaction between two predictors. In this scenario, x1 is going to be our categorical predictor, something like whether or not you wear a seatbelt or which of the two color photos you looked at. x2 is going to be our continuous predictor variable, something like age, for example. And then this third thing that's new is the interaction term, b3, x1, x2. In order to test for an interaction, we are quite literally going to take the two predictor variables, x1 and x2, and multiply them by each other. You might have wondered when we talked about interactions last semester, why we would talk about, for example, age by gender interactions, or gender by smiley face interactions. The by is a multiplication sign, because mathematically what we're doing is we're literally multiplying them together. So if we want to test for an interaction between two variables, one of which is categorical and the other of which is continuous, these are the four steps we're going to need to follow. First, as we saw a minute ago, we're going to dummy code our categorical predictor. Every person's score on the categorical predictor should be either a zero or a one, depending on which group they're in. Second, we're going to mean center our continuous predictor x2, which as we just saw, we can do in syntax by creating a new variable that subtracts the mean from each person's score. Third, we're going to take those two variables that we just created, x1 and x2, and multiply them by each other. That will create a new variable 
that will be our interaction term. And finally, continuing on what we talked about last class, we're going to enter all three of these predictors, x1, x2, and the interaction term, into our regression, but we're going to do so hierarchically. So in block one, we're going to include only x1 and x2. In block two, we'll include those same variables again, but we'll also add the interaction term. What we'll eventually do is we'll compare block two, which has the interaction, against block one, which does not have the interaction, and that will tell us whether adding the interaction term improves our model or not. Here's the example that we're going to use first. Does the size of a person's signature predict how narcissistic they are? Here's one example. I think that speaks for itself. Here's what these researchers did. They brought participants into the laboratory and first they had them sign a document, as they normally would. They then coded how big that person's signature is. They also had each person fill out a narcissism scale to measure their level of narcissism in order to see whether there was a relationship between the size of a person's signature and how narcissistic they are. The researchers also hypothesized that the relationship between signature size and narcissism might be different for men and women. This is where we're getting into the interaction. We want to know not only is there a relationship between signature size and narcissism, but does the nature of that relationship differ depending on whether one is a man or a woman? In other words, does that relationship depend on the sex of the person who's writing the signature? To answer these questions, we're going to use the data file signatures.sav. For each person, we know three things. First, we know their sex, whether they're a man or a woman. Second, we know how big their signature size is. Larger numbers mean a bigger signature. Third, we know their score on the narcissism scale. Larger numbers mean more narcissism. As I mentioned a few slides ago, there's four steps that we're going to follow in order to test for the interaction between sex and signature size when used to predict narcissism. The first three of those four steps can all be done using syntax. Here's the syntax for all three of those steps, which we'll go through one at a time. Step one is to make sure that our categorical variable, which in this case is sex, is dummy coded correctly. Now, we might get lucky and open our data file to find that it already is dummy coded as zero or one. Unfortunately, in this case, that didn't happen. When you open this file, you'll notice that men are coded as one and women are coded as two. So the first thing we need to do is switch that so that it's zero and one instead of one and two. First, we'll recode the sex variable. Anyone who originally had a one, we will change to a zero. Anyone who originally had a two, we will change to a one. We also need to update the labels to indicate that zero now indicates men, one now indicates women. And remember, of course, to type execute to tell SPSS to do its thing. So these first three lines of syntax will dummy code our sex variable correctly. Each participant will either have a zero or a one for sex after we run this syntax. Step two is to mean center our continuous predictor which in this case is signature size. So we're going to compute a new variable, which we'll call sig size underscore cent for mean centered. And we'll make that new variable equal to each person's original signature size minus the mean signature size, which of course we'd have to calculate through descriptive statistics. And we would find that the mean signature size in our sample was 653.647. Each person's new signature size variable, the mean centered version, will indicate whether their uh, signature size is above or below the average. So if, they if their mean centered signature size score is positive, it means that their signature is larger than average. If their mean centered signature size is negative, it means that their signature is smaller than average. 
Our third step is to create the interaction term, which as I mentioned before, involves literally multiplying the two predictors by each other. So what we'll do here is we'll compute a new variable, which I called sex by sig size. This is gonna be our interaction term. And it's gonna be equal to the dummy coded sex variable that we just created, multiplied by, that's what that asterisk does, multiplied by the mean centered signature size for each person. So running all of this syntax is going to not only fix the dummy coding of the sex variable, it's also going to give us two new variables in our data file. Each person under data view will now also have a mean centered signature size variable as well as an interaction term. All of the men you'll notice have an interaction term equal to zero. That's not a mistake. That doesn't mean you did it wrong. That's exactly how it should look. Now that we've done the first three steps, previous slide, let me jump back for a second, we should ask for these in the statistics menu. Be sure to ask for R squared change statistics so that we get the right side of this table. Model one, which included only sex and signature size, explained 17% of the variance in narcissism, whereas model two, which contained the interaction, explained about 21% of the variance in narcissism. If we look at the R squared change statistic highlighted in light blue, that tells us that adding the interaction term to the model explained an additional 4% of the variance in narcissism. Model one was significant. So knowing signature size and sex was better than knowing nothing. However, model two was also significant meaning it was significantly better than model one with a p-value of 0 0.004. What that tells us is that adding the interaction term improved our model, improved our predictions. In other words, the interaction was significant. If we go down to the coefficients table, we can look at each of the predictors individually within each of the two models. In model one, signature size did predict narcissism, but sex did not. So if you think about this in factorial ANOVA terms, we had a main effect of signature size, but no main effect of sex. In model two, neither of those variables predicted narcissism, but most importantly, the interaction was significant. Notice that the p-value for the interaction here is 0.004. That's the same p-value we saw in the F change test for model two on the previous slide at the very bottom right hand side of the model summary table. So what we know so far is that there is a significant interaction between sex and signature size when predicting narcissism. In other words, the relationship between signature size and narcissism appears to be different for men than it is for women. The last step is gonna be for us to make sense of this significant interaction. How exactly are signature size and narcissism related for men? And how are those same variables related for women? To make sense of this interaction, what we'll do is we will split our file by sex. So go to data split file and split the file by your sex variable. Then we will run a simple linear regression looking at signature size as a predictor of narcissism. However, since we've already split our file, in the output we will get two simple regressions, one that uses just the men in our sample and one that uses just the women. Here's what that output should look like. On the left, we have a regression just using men. On the right, we have a regression just using women. The output on the left shows us that for men, there was no significant relationship between signature size and narcissism. On the right, the output shows us that for women, there was a significant and positive relationship between signature size and narcissism. Notice how different the p-values are. Notice how different the betas are. Notice how different the t-statistics are. What this is telling us is that the relationship for women is significant the relationship for men is not. So in other words, our conclusion here is going to be 
that the relationship between signature size and narcissism depends on sex. For women, having a bigger signature predicts more narcissism. But for men, signature size is not related to narcissism. Here's what our write-up would look like. As always, our first sentence is just going to explain what we did, set the stage for our write-up. We use a hierarchical regression to test sex, signature size, and the interaction between those two variables as predictors of narcissism. In parentheses, we specify that sex was dummy coded and that anyone who had a zero was a man. For signature size, we specify in parentheses that that continuous variable was mean-centered prior to the analysis. First, we will briefly mention the results of step one. Step one was significant, as shown by the F-test in orange. And step one told us that together, sex and signature size explain 17% of the variance in narcissism. That's fine, but what we really care about is the interaction, which didn't come in until step two. The results of the F change test told us that adding the interaction term to the model made it better. In other words, model two was significantly better than model one. After we added the interaction term, the value of R squared increased from 17.1% without the interaction to 21.2% with the interaction. Because the interaction was significant, we then used simple regressions to make sense of it. Specifically, what we found in those simple regressions was that signature size did predict narcissism for women, but signature size did not predict narcissism for men. Let's now look at a second example, which you can try on your own if you'd like. The Napoleon complex is the popular belief that shorter men tend to be more aggressive or domineering to compensate for their smaller stature. Notably, this also applies to corgis, and Napoleon is Rocky's legal middle name. Does this actually pan out in research, though? In one study, authors tried to see if people who feel small more often tend to keep more resources for themselves when given the opportunity to do so. So in this study, participants came into the laboratory and they filled out a survey, which among other things, asked them for their sex. They reported whether they were a man or a woman. And they also answered a, a continuous question, which asked them how often they feel small on a scale from one, meaning never, to seven, meaning often. Later in the study, they were given an envelope full of coins, actual money, and they were given an opportunity to keep some of the coins for themselves and leave the rest of the coins behind. They would ostensibly be given to the next participant. So the dependent variable here is how many coins did they leave behind, ostensibly giving that money to another person. If that number is larger, it means they kept fewer coins for themselves. If that number is smaller, it means they kept more coins for themselves. So the hypothesis here, according to this Napoleon complex, is that people who feel small more often, in other words, who give higher answers to that question on the survey, would leave fewer coins behind for other people. So we would expect a negative relationship between those two variables. However, as in the previous example, the researchers also wanted to know whether that relationship was different for men and women. The data are in the data file napoleon.sav, and we're trying to answer the following two questions. First, is there a relationship between feeling small and keeping resources for oneself, such that people who feel small left fewer coins for the other person? Then we wanted to test the interaction between sex and feeling small in order to see if this relationship is different for men and women. Does the relationship between feeling small and leaving coins for someone else depend on the person's sex? Try these four steps. First, if necessary, dummy code the sex variable. Make sure that it's coded as either zero or one. Second, mean center the feeling small variable. So you'll need to calculate the mean score for feeling small, 
and then compute a new variable that takes each person's original feeling small score and subtracts the mean from it. Third, you'll compute the interaction term by multiplying the dummy coded sex variable times the mean centered feeling small variable. Once you have all those variables, you'll run a hierarchical regression with sex and mean centered feeling small in step one and then add the interaction term as a third predictor in step two. If the interaction is significant, you'll split the file by sex and you'll run separate simple regressions for men and women to see how, if at all, the relationship between feeling small and giving money to another person is different for men and women. If you wanna pause now to try this problem on your own before we go through it together, now is when you should do that. Okay, let's look at this. So the first thing we would check is whether the sex variable needs to be dummy coded or not. But fortunately, it was already dummy coded for us. Men were coded as zero, women were coded as one. So we don't even need to do step one because it was already coded that way. For steps two and three, we can use the following syntax. The first line of syntax computes a new variable called feel small centered which is equal to each person's feeling small score minus the mean, which was 2.8833. The second line of syntax computes the interaction term. I called it sex by small. It's equal to each person's sex coded as zero or one, multiplied by their mean centered feeling small score. We can run all of this syntax at the same time, and it'll give us two new variables at the end of our data file. Each person now has a score for the mean centered feeling small variable and a score for the interaction term. Now we can run the hierarchical regression. Remember that you should put sex and mean centered feeling small in block one, and then in block two, keep those same variables, but add the interaction term as a third predictor. We can cut right to the chase here. At the bottom right hand side of the table, we see that model two, which is the model with the interaction, was significantly better than model one, which was the model without the interaction. That tells us that adding the interaction term made our predictions better, which is another way of saying that the interaction term was significant. So everything in green, we would report in our results as the F change test showing the significance of the interaction. Next, we would split the file by sex and do separate simple regressions for men and women with feeling small as our predictor variable and coins left behind as our outcome variable. On the top, we have the results for men. On the bottom, we have the results for women. We see that for men, there was a significant negative relationship between feeling small and giving coins to another person. The more small a man felt, the fewer coins they left for someone else, which is the same thing as saying the more coins they kept for themselves. For women, however, there was no relationship between feeling small and the number of coins that they left for the other person. So it appears that the idea that people who feel small tend to hoard more resources for themselves is true for men, but not for women. Here's what our write-up would look like. First, we briefly explain what we did. A hierarchical regression tested sex, feeling small, and their interaction as predictors of how many coins the participant left for another person. Sex was dummy coded with zero indicating man. Feeling small was mean centered prior to the analysis being run. In step one, which you can see on the previous slide, even though I didn't point it out, sex and feeling small explained 9% of the variance in coins left which actually wasn't significant. However, in step two, the model got significantly better after we added the interaction term. Specifically, after we added the interaction term, R squared increased from 9% to 18.6%. So the interaction term explained an additional 9.6% of the variance in how many coins the participant left behind. Because the interaction was significant, we ran simple effects tests to see how that relationship differed between men and women. Men who felt smaller 
tended to leave fewer coins for another person and keep more coins for themselves. But for women, there was no relationship between feeling small and leaving coins. So in each of the examples we just walked through, we had two predictors, one of which was continuous and the other of which was dichotomous, categorical. We dummy coded the categorical variable as either zero and one, and in each case, what we found is that the relationship between X and Y depended on the categorical predictor, which in both cases happened to be sex. The relationship was different for men and women. In the next video, we'll talk briefly about how our approach changes somewhat if our categorical predictor has not two levels, but three levels.